The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few days, Uncle Sam's letter carriers have been delivering thousands of postcards mailed by Equitable Society representatives. Friday night on This Is Your FBI, these postcards say, the Equitable Life Assurance Society is going to give eye-opening information about its famous independent 60s plan. That's a practical, workable plan for men and women who want to be financially independent after reaching the age of 60. So listen carefully when I give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Cargo. qualitative differences between criminals. Some of them are important from the point of view of society's fight against crime, and some of them are harmless irritants. But perhaps the greatest criminal of them all is the man who schemes to send people, other people, into war. For him, there are no words to describe the depths of his conscience. Indeed, the probability is that he has no such thing. For no man with a semblance of human charity could plan to inflict bloodshed upon others for his own personal profit. And yet there are such people. To name Hitler would be to name the obvious. But there are others. Others who do not regard themselves as leaders or statesmen, but who are interested in the carnage they cause because to them, the bigger the battle, the bigger the profit. They can see in a war only the long rows of dollar signs and never the even longer rows of plain white wooden crosses. Tonight's file opens in a neat waterfront cottage located in a small fishing village along the Southern California coast. An elderly woman is tidying the living room as the front door opens. Rings on my fingers Elephants to ride upon. Wayne, what My in the world? Little Irish rose. Wayne, put me down. <laughs> Stop this nonsense. Have you been drinking? Drinking? Not a drop. Then what's got into you? I got a ship, Mary. What? I got me a ship. Oh, that's wonderful, Wayne. <laughs> tell me all about it. It happened all of a sudden, Mary. Oh, tell me. Uh, well, I went down to the wharf this morning. Like usual. Yes. Sat around a while. Then I went over to Ned's lunchroom for a bowl of soup. Yes. There was a fella there. Uh, Ned introduced me. Said he was looking for a skipper. Uh-huh. I talked to him. He hired. Oh, goodness. My regular pay, too. Have you seen the boat? No, he's taken me to see her this afternoon. But from his description, is just like the old Mary Ann. Mm. Who is this man who hired you? Her name's uh, Finney. Joe Finney. Never seen him before. Well, when does he want to ship out? Soon as she's fit. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Mr. Finney said if the trip was successful, he'd guarantee me $300 extra. Oh, my. When I get that money, we'll pay the back rent. Then we'll be even with the world. Oh, Wayne, I can't believe it. Say, dinner ready yet? Oh, just about. Well, let's go in and sit down at the captain's table. Joe? Yeah. Where have you been? I bought the supplies. All of them? Uh-huh. 
When are they going to deliver them to the boat? They're on the boat already. That's what kept me. Oh. I got something else done, Pete. What? I got us a captain. Who is he? An old guy named Stevens. Any good? Well, I asked around about him, and nobody put in a knock. Well, that sounds all right. When's he coming down to the boat? Four o'clock. I want to be there. Sure. What did you tell him the boat was used for? Fishing. Did he believe it? Yeah. <laughs> sounds like we're in business. In a nearby city at the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is standing by the teletype machines as Agent Mark Butler approaches. Catching up on news, Jim? Oh, I'm excited. Well, the San Francisco office is going to try to pick up the last member of that Jackson gang today, and I was just wondering whether anything came in on it. Did it? No, not yet. Are you going back to your office now? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, I was just in to see the boss. He told me to work with you on the government property case. Oh, fine. Fine, I can use the help. What's the story on it? Well, come on, I'll show you the files. Good. I'll tell you as much of it as I can remember. There's been a series of thefts from a bonded warehouse here in town. You've probably heard about them. Yes. Well, there's some reason to believe that they're all the work of the same persons. Why is that, Jim? Well, everything they've stolen has disappeared. Mm. Now, the way I figure, if this were the work of a large organized mob, they'd steal the stuff and get rid of it. None of this stuff has ever turned up. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Thanks. Has anybody seen the thieves, Jim? Well, we have a report that two men were seen leaving the warehouse one night last week, but before they could be identified, they ran. Oh. Let's see, yeah. Oh, here it is. Here's the file on it. It mainly contains evidence against the one known suspect in the case, a watchman at the warehouse named Dillon. Well, how did he come into the case? Well, in a couple of instances, it appeared as if the thieves had been let into the building. No marks indicating forcible entrance were ever found. Uh, you've interviewed Dillon? Yeah, I had a long talk with him three days ago. He protested his innocence, told me a long story to prove that he had nothing to do with the thefts. Well, how did the story stand up? It didn't. I checked the facts and found a number of instances where Dillon simply hadn't told the truth. Have you questioned him since? Well, I went to his rooming house this morning to talk to him. What did he say? Nothing. He was dead. Oh. What happened? He committed suicide. Hmm. Any repenting notes? No. No, but I'd say a suicide amounts to a confession. Mm, more than likely. I did find something in his room that has me puzzled, though, Mark. What was that, Jim? Well, it was a notebook with a lot of phone numbers. No names, just phone numbers. I'm having the switchboard get me a name and address on every number now. Oh, that should give us some kind of a lead. Yeah. As soon as I get the list back, Mark, we'll split it up and go to work. Which boat is it, Joe? Uh, our next one down. I can't tell one from the other. They all look alike. And they all smell alike, too. You know, Pete, if we're traveling a thousand miles in that sky, we ought to have it perfumed or something. I think that we... Hey. What? Somebody's on our boat. Come huh? on. How do we get on it? Just jump down. Oh, okay. Who oh, it is? Oh, oh, it's him. Who? The captain I hired. Mr. Finney. Hi. I got here early. Thought I'd look around. Uh, Captain, this is Mr. Jones, my partner. Hello, Mr. Jones. Hello, Captain. Well, how do you like the boat? Looks mighty trim. How much of it did you see? Just above decks. Haven't been below yet. Oh. Uh, Mr. Jones, I told the captain we wanted to go out when the rest of the fishing boats do. Good. If it's albacore you're after, they'll be running real soon. You uh, know this coast good, do you, Captain? Like the palm of my hand. Well, fine. Oh, uh, Mr. Finney. Yeah? I hate to start in running up expenses, but some of that rigging should be replaced. Okay. How much will it cost? Oh, just the price of new line. Can you fix it soon? Right away. Here. Here's some dough for the stuff. Why, this is a $50 bill. <laughs> That's right. Did you ever see one before? Not for a long time. Well, I... I think I'll take a look around below. Uh, no, never mind that. Huh? Just go get those new lines so we'll be ready to go real quick, huh? Well, I... We'll meet you back here tomorrow morning. 
All right. Be here at 7. Yes, sir. So long, Captain. Goodbye, gentlemen. Uh, goodbye, Captain. Why did you get rid of him? Because the hole is full of supplies. Forgot to lock him up. If he saw him, he gets suspicious. Oh. I figured, uh, let him think we're going on a fishing trip until we get started. Uh-huh. Well, we'd better get back up to the city and get those guns. Special Agent Butler. Oh, Mark, this is Jim. I've got something. So have I. What? One of those phone numbers on my list turned out to be a place that rents trucks. Well, that's probably where they got their transportation. Yeah. I checked the rental records on the dates that things were reported stolen, and the same man rented a truck every one of those days. Uh, what's his name? He rented in the name of Joe Brunswick, but the address he gave turned out to be a department store in Bay Harbor. The oh, name must be a fake, too, then. That's my guess. However, I did get a description on the man, and I'm having it checked against the files. What was the description, Mark? 28 to 30 years old, Caucasian, 5 feet 9 or 10 inches tall, about 155 pounds, good shoulders, slight limp in left leg. Hey, I saw that man a couple of minutes ago. What? Yes, one of the phone numbers on my half the list turned out to be a warehouse. Oh? So I came over here to check. I saw a man answering that description enter the place just a couple of minutes ago. Where are you calling from? Candy store across the street from the warehouse. It's at uh, 719 West Montgomery Street. I'll be there as soon as I can, Jim. Okay, Mark. I'm going in now. That you, Pete? No. No, it isn't. Huh? What have you got in those cases? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. What are you doing here? This is a legitimate place. I didn't say it wasn't. I've got a search warrant here, and I asked you a question. What's in those cases? It's canned food. I don't know what kind. It ain't my job. Look, if you'll come back in the morning, the office can tell you. I got this warrant because I didn't want to wait until tomorrow morning. Now, are you going to open one of those cases, or do you want me to? I, I can't open anything here. I'll lose my job. Okay, then I'll open one. Oh, stay away from the crowbar. I'll pick it up myself. Look, I'll get fired for this, mister. You'll get more than that. You're under arrest. For what? This crate is full of guns. Guns? That's right. Mister, look, I only work here. I don't own that stuff. You think I open every crate that comes in here? I'd save that story if I were you, Brunswick. My name ain't Brunswick. I know. That's the name you used when you rented the truck. What truck? Oh, look, we can go into all this when we get downtown. Now, come on. Nice going, Pete. Let's move this stuff out of here. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Did you say independent 60s? Yes, Harry, it means complete financial independence after you're 60 years old. Sure, your children would take care of you, but isn't it better to be your own boss for life? You bet it is. To one man, independent 60s means carefree days in the great outdoors, listening to the sweetest music in the world, the whirl of a fishing reel after a big one is struck. To another man, is getting in a family car and starting off on that long-awaited trip. Think of it, Madge. Yellowstone Park, the Grand Canyon, then Mexico. But whatever dream you may have of your independent 60s, remember this. Dreaming won't make it come true. After all, this matter is your job, and nobody else's. So why not do something about it right now? Start by investigating the famous independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. 
I always thought that a plan like that would run into more money than I could afford. Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Harry, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between age 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this Equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures. Get in touch with him soon. Or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Curious Cargo. various crimes committed by the criminals in tonight's case should constitute a warning to all of us. For these are men who have banded together for the express purpose of breaking the law. One man, the watchman, has already taken his own life because when the pressure came, he found that he was on his own, that the loyalty he expected from his fellow criminals was not forthcoming. But although it is important for you to know that there is no such thing as loyalty among thieves, that is not the message your FBI wishes you to take away from this radio program. All over the nation, even as you are listening to this, there are men meeting and planning some illegal enterprise. For this is the time in history, this is the post-war period when gangsterism flourishes. Your FBI is fighting these gangsters and will continue to fight them, but it needs your help. You must see to it that your local police is a politically unhampered organization. And you must see to it that they are strong enough to meet the challenge. A challenge that must be met if we are to win the war against crime. Tonight's file continues in the emergency room of a local hospital. Well, Jim, how do you feel? Mm. Oh. oh, hello, Mark. You any better? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Just laying here trying to piece this thing together. How did I get here? Well, when I got to the warehouse, I found you on the floor. Oh. You remember anything that happened, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, I was just arresting that man I'd followed into the warehouse. One with a limp, and somebody came up behind me. Knocked me out. <laughs> we had them, Mark, uh... I let him get away. Oh, don't take it so hard. We'll catch up to him again. Any new leads? No, well, not so far. But the office is working on the real estate records to see who owns that warehouse we found you in. Mm. Maybe that'll give us something to go on. Mark, will you call the doctor? I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here in bed. I've me. already talked to that doctor, and you're to stay in bed. I don't get it. He said the pictures showed no fracture and no concussion, but you need rest. Oh, that's fine. I'm going back down to the office now, Jim. See if they've got anything on the owner of the warehouse. Now, look, Mark... I'll stop you... by here to see you this evening. Well, that you, Wayne? Yes, Mary. Well, you've been down to see the boat? Yes, well, for a man who's gone back to sea, you don't look very happy. I'm trying to make up my mind, Mary. About what? Whether to take this job or not. Why, what's the matter? Well... What is it, Wayne? I want to take the job, Mary, but there's a problem. Well, what is it? Well, I've come to the conclusion that they're not going fishing. But it is a fishing boat. What else would they want it for? I don't know. But when I went back aboard her this afternoon, I saw something I didn't like. Well, what was that? They had enough supplies on the boat to feed us for a month. We're supposed to go out for albacore. When they're running, you, you can fill a boat like that in two days. Oh. Another thing, I needed some money for repairs. One of the owners gave me a $50 bill. That reminded me too much of the men who used to come around here trying to rent boats during Prohibition. Well, you do whatever you like about it, Wayne. This may be my last chance for a boat, Mary. Wayne, if you're talking this over with me to get my advice, I'd say tell them you don't want the boat. Thank you, Mary. 
and I see them tomorrow morning, I'm saying I quit. Special Agent Butler speaking. Hello, Mark. This is Jim. Jim? I'm just about to leave the hospital. You're what? I'm getting out of here. Oh, look. Now, look, I'm all right now. What did you find out on the warehouse? Well, the reports show that it was leased in the dead watchman's name. Oh, great. That puts us right back where we started. Yeah, I'm afraid so. You know, while I was getting dressed, I kept thinking about that fake address in Bay Harbor given by the man who rented the truck. Well, what about it? Well, there's just a chance that he and his confederate are really in Bay Harbor. Mark, the office hasn't taken me off this case because of the accident, has it? No. Oh, that's fine. And there are a couple of things I'd like you to do for me. Name them. Will you get two John Doe warrants? Okay. And will you call the local police at Bay Harbor, tell them what's happened, and give them a description, too? Right. We'll get down to Bay Harbor first thing in the morning and look around. <laughs> Well, Joe, we've got everything in the hold now. I thought we'd never get finished. What time is that captain coming? Ought to be here any time now. Why? Well, we want to get out of here with the rest of the boats, and they're getting ready to leave at noon. Look, why do we want to leave with the rest of the boats? Nobody will notice us. So when we get outside the harbor, we can start south. Yeah. How long will it take us to get there, Pete? Uh, about two weeks in this thing. Oh, yeah. Hmm? Oh. Hi, Captain. Come on board. I'm coming. Boat here. Well, you ready to go, Captain? No, I'm not. Well, how soon can you be? Well, I've been thinking about this, and I know I promised you I'd skip the boat, but I'm afraid you'll have to count me out. What? Well, now, wait a minute. It's a little late for that. You can get another captain. In fact, old Cap Warwick has no ship. We want you. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, but I've already made up my mind. So have I. What are you doing with that gun? Take one guess. Now, are you going with us or not? I'm not. Take him below, Joe. When he comes to, he'll change his mind. It was a good hunch you had, Jim, going to the lunchroom. Well, at least we know that the man with the limp has been in town and that he talked to Captain Stevens. I hope Stevens is at home. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be a tough boat to find, Jim. Did you see how many there were in the harbor? Yeah, and they all look the same. Well, I guess that's the Stevens shack right here on the left. Yeah, it looks like the place was described to us. You go ahead, Mark. I'll slide out on your side. Okay, Jim. Make it? Yeah, that's fine. You suppose that woman hanging laundry out there is Mrs. Stevens? Well, let's find out, huh? Pardon me. Are you Mrs. Stevens? Well, yes, I am. Well, we're special agents of the FBI, Mrs. Stevens. Here are my credentials. This is Agent Butler. Uh, what do you want? Well, we came to see your husband. Is he at home? Uh, no, he's not. He went down to see two men who wanted him to work on their boat. Uh, did one of the men have a slight limp in one leg? Well, yes, I believe Wayne did mention that. Do you know the name of the boat, Mrs. Stevens? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but if you wait, the captain will be back soon. He went down to tell the two men that he didn't want to work for them. You see, he was suspicious of them. Mm -hmm. What was he suspicious of? Well, he didn't think they were really going fishing. Well, he's right. The whole of that boat is full of stolen goods. Oh, heavens. Captain Stevens told him his suspicions. There might be trouble, Jim. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Mark. Oh. Mrs. Stevens, is it true that all the boats are going out at noon? Yes. A word came in that there's a run to Albacore, and they'll all go out with the tide. Well, that throws out the possibility of searching every boat. There just wouldn't be time, even with a dozen men. But they won't be back for three days. Tell me, is that all the time that any of the boats stay out? When the Albacore are running, yes. Have you phoned Mrs. Stevens? No, we haven't. I see. Well, if you'll excuse us, we'll go into the village and find one. Come on, Mark. I've got an idea. Yeah, he's coming out of it. We'll keep working on him. 
We've got to get started pretty soon. All right. Come on, come on. Here, throw this water in his kisser. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Come on, come on, Cap. Get with it, will you? Come on. Uh, all right. Can you hear me? Yes. Those cases over there are full of guns, and we've got to get them out of here. You said you knew the water's down south. Well, you're going to get a chance to prove it. I'm not going. Mister would be crazy to let you walk off this boat alive, and we're not going to. But you can't. Why not? Who's going to stop us? Where you are? Huh? Hold it. What? Where's the boat up, Mark? Right, Jim. Take the cops. Special agents, the FBI. we got warrants here for the arrest of both of them. Okay, Mark, take them above. Right. All right, you two. Up you go. All right. All right. I didn't have anything to do with those guns. Well, we know that, Captain Stevens. How do you know my name? Oh, we've been to your house. We saw Mrs. Stevens. She doesn't know it yet, but she's the one who sent us down here. But she didn't even know the name of the boat, did she? No, but she knew enough to tell us that the rest of those boats would only be out three or four days. So I checked the supply stores. This boat took on enough supplies for a month. That's when I knew this had to be the boat we wanted. Now, come on up on deck with me, Captain Stevens. We're taking those men into custody. <laughs> Joe Finney and Pete Jones were sentenced to 10 years each for theft of government property. And so your FBI was able to prevent the crime of stealing government property from being compounded by the two criminals in tonight's case. For it was their intention to sell those guns to insurrectionists in a Latin American country that men they never saw would die because of their sale of those stolen goods meant nothing to this pair. In fact, it never entered their minds. For the attitude of criminals towards others is what must have inspired the phrase, man's inhumanity to man. Thus, once again, your FBI closed the careers of a pair of sadistic lawbreakers and not only protected the security of you, the American people, but also the security of people in a distant foreign land. On such protection as that is founded the reputation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation of your FBI. <laughs> In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Are these plans flexible, Mr. Keating? Can the amount be increased if my income goes up in the next five years? It certainly can. Your Equitable Society representative will tell you that many successful men have done exactly that. What about my present life insurance? Your Equitable representative will show you how your present insurance gives you a head start on this plan. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story of the short criminal career of two youthful female bandits. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Phantom Bandits. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bantam Bandits on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.